Uh, being um, at these meetings really reminds me and kind of reinforces with me what an amazing time this is to be in medicine. Everything is changing and turning over. Um, everything we understand about what it is to be a physician, my role is being completely turned over. And so that's what I'd like to talk about today is uh, this changing role of the physician with specific attention to this idea of a public physician. You know, we talk very loosely about this issue of doctors using social media and how we need to be using Twitter and this and that. Um, I think we need to really focus on some deliberate attention to what we might call, or might refer to as um, our, our public role or the public physician role. So I want to discuss over the next 20 minutes how we became public, um, why this is so critically important for all of us to be participating in, and uh, perhaps some of the challenges we may face uh, going forward. Um, in the, the reason this talk may be particularly important and why this subject matter may be particularly important is because the vast majority of the physicians that we engage with um, in our hospitals and in our clinics are completely and thoroughly unprepared to deal with the communication environment that we currently live in. Okay, doctors just like this mid-20th century doctor are trained to be inward facing, right? We're trained to be siloed. And um, we as, I guess, forward thinkers, I might put us all in that category, um, need to feel some responsibility to prepare our colleagues for participation in, in a network age. Um, how did I become public? I guess my story, in, in, in some respects, reflects the, a physician's change to, to, the, to the public realm. When I was a resident, uh, I was a freelance writer for parenting magazines. Um, I, uh, instead of working in the emergency room, decided to do freelance writing and, and worked for American Baby and Parenting, and um, that led to a, a book deal in 2006. And at the time, all my buddies said to me, in order to promote your book, you have to have a blog. There was no social media at the time, so I dutifully started a blog called Parenting Solved, which is actually still live. Uh, it's kind of fun to look at it because it's a little dated, but um, I said, I'll do this for a few months, sell some books and bug out, right? It's a good, good gimmick for selling books. And a couple months into this, I realized um, I really had a platform to the world. There were a number of things that happened that really illustrated to me that this is uh, something transformative. My capacity to have a platform to the world was, was transformative. And so in 2008, I started monkeying around with Twitter and kind of in the same way I said, this is kind of interesting and curious. Let me see what, what this could do in terms of doctor-patient communication, doctor-doctor dialogue. And, um, in 2009, I saw more and more doctors coming into what I call the public space. Okay, and with that came a lot of issues. Uh, doctors are asking questions like, what do I do when a patient asks me a question? What do I do when someone says, uh, a patient you know, says something mean about me or, or criticizes me? And so I, I began a site called 33 Charts as a place for um, sort of initiating this dialogue about the issues that doctors were facing at this intersection of medicine in this new age. And I've been real fortunate that this has served as sort of a center of community for a lot of the discussion that's happened around some of these issues that we're facing. Um, in many ways, my transition to 33 Charts and what I do there kind of represents, um, represents this role of a public physician. It's, it's formative thinking. It's me bearing my soul almost in, in the way that Jordan is talking um, with the public. Um, so how do we get this way? How do we get um, to the point where we had a doctor who was, had his ideas and created his own space for sharing them with the world. Well, it used to be pretty easy back, uh, back in the day. Um, everything that people knew about us was limited to this 15-minute encounter with patients, right? We'd come into the exam room and um, we'd control ourselves pretty well during that time period. And what happened on the outside was really controlled, in the United States at least, by the American Medical Association and the uh, public affairs office of the local hospital. Okay, they would decide what quotes would be represented of us in the, in, the, in the media, what images and what pictures would be used. We always had a white coat. We always had a stethoscope around our neck. Um, and so we were, we, were, we were painted to look one way. But as you know, as well as I, that something happened. Um, something happened on the way to the clinic. The internet appeared, right? And uh, the audience became the publisher, and a lot of physicians, in turn, became publishers. Um, and so what we saw happening um, over the past decade is the appearance of the most unique voices appearing. This is Z-Dog MD and um, anyone who was brave enough to step out and use these homemade platforms 
could have their voice and their opinion heard. And so what we started to see appear um, is this idea of, of an online digital culture. Okay, and that's kind of reflected in some of these images. This is my creepy techno image up top there that my hospital didn't like me using. Um, <laughs> but we have this culture where we can express ourselves. And um, so, so there's this profession that was once, you know, our view was completely controlled by this old vertically integrated hierarchy has now been taken over by the profession itself. And we, in turn, have become um, public physicians. Okay, now the public physician describes our presence and engagement outside the exam room. Okay, it's a role that involves not just social engagement, but the translation of content and the translation of our knowledge for the public well-being. Okay, it's a big role. Um, this is another way to manifest or represent uh, our, our, how our public image has or public presence has evolved. You know, for, for most of our, our uh, humanity, we have consumed information as physicians. We've only consumed stuff that other people have created, but with Web 2.0 and our ability to talk back and create, um, we've seen this emergence of a, of, a, of a new part of engagement. And this hierarchy is kind of interesting because it still represents, um, I've tried to you know, express by the size of the, the bars uh, how people participate, and still most physicians just consume things. As we go further up the hierarchy, very few people, very few physicians actually create things. Um, we've talked a lot about curation this morning. Uh, Amory was talking about curation, and I used to go around the countryside telling physicians how they really need to be creating content. Um, and I've realized over time what a difficult ask that is for many physicians. It's, it's a, creating and writing is, is, is it's easy for me to talk about it, but it's, e it's very, very difficult for people to initiate. So I think there may be, there may be real money or maybe real opportunity in the middle part of that, that hierarchy. Um, asking doctors to curate, participate in the conversation, um, as we'll talk about in a second with respect to vaccines, are things that we can do. Um, I always tell doctors, too, that there are only two things on the internet, right? There's content and there's conversation about content. And so just looking at this, if you can create the content that everyone else is having conversations about, that's where you, as a healthcare provider, build the audience, the eyeballs, the attention. Remember, we live in an attention economy now, right? And that's real power. It's power to change minds. So how do we build this case for public presence? Um, a lot of doctors will say, I don't want to do this. I, I want to um, choose not to do this. I'd rather not. Um, but the unfortunate thing is, uh, it really isn't a choice anymore. Um, the moment you lay your hands on a patient, you become a public physician because that patient very well and very likely may pull you into public dialogue, right? You'll be part of that, part of that public conversation. And when a, one of these medical students crosses the stage at the University of Limerick, is that right? Um, and grabs their diploma and updates their status on, pay, on Facebook, they suddenly and instantly become public physicians. Not real intentional, but, but, but it is. So it's inevitable. Um, so. I always like to say that participation for physicians is optional, I guess, but so is relevance, right? Um, <laughs> David Weinberger has uh, got, another, got a quote here which sort of summarizes why it's sort of inevitable, and that's the fact that our, the way we get information, the way we communicate, the way we talk, the way we share is all starting to happen on the same channels. Our personal learning networks, our continuing medical education, it's all being to happen in the same spaces, okay? And so another reason why our participation in these spaces is kind of uh, inevitable. And perhaps one of the most powerful arguments for us participating um, is the fact that we have the capacity and the ability to sort of shape the way the world sees us uh, through the stories like Jordan was talking about, through our, our passions for public health initiatives. Um, we can create that story, our own personal reputation, which I know, I, we, as Anne-Marie suggested, we need to move beyond that, and that's true. But uh, nonetheless, people will you know, create our story for us if we don't do it. And so that's perhaps the most compelling uh, argument. And we, you can almost argue that we're entering a new stage of individual responsibility in medicine. It used to be that all this messaging and all this representation was really established by our professional organizations that did all the talking for us. It was some lady in an office with a fax machine and a, uh, and a clipboard. Um, So visibility also creates opportunity, and this is another powerful argument for our participation. You can talk to any of the doctors here today, and they'll tell you that when we think publicly, um, people uh, will want to talk to us, and when people want to talk to us, things will happen. 
Okay, and this goes for your, your research initiative, your educational programs, your personal reputation, your speaking career, whatever. Um, it's really, really powerful. Um, earlier this year, um, CBS This Morning, which is one of the major network shows, reached out to me on Twitter um, to ask if I would uh, come on and give a commentary about one of the recent studies on physician reviews. And so I did this, and it was a lot of exposure for our hospital. And one of our executives said, um, they're supposed to contact us. And I said, well, they know who I am, and they, they don't know who you are. And that's kind of the way things have changed. Things, things used to come through one channel of public affairs, and now we're all individual brand ambassadors for our institutions, and um, it's important for us to represent that uh, appropriately. Tomorrow's medical leaders will also be very, very public. You know, it used to be that um, medical leaders were defined by a certain hierarchy within this old institution. The amount of IV that you had outside your wall, the amount, number of publications you had in a peer-reviewed journal, your position within the society or the guild determined um, determined leadership and authority. Um, I think that in this new age, within this next generation, um, you're going to see a, a population of doctors emerge whose authority is determined not by these old industrial age indicators of authority, but rather newer age indicators of authority, people with amazing ideas. Um, and I think that our, our leaders, we're going to see medical leaders emerging in this generation who um, understand that um, you know, authority and leadership is built by looking outward, not staying chained within our unique silos. Um, and perhaps this is our most compelling argument. This is where our patients are at. And this is, this is why we should be there. This should have been my first point, honestly. Um, and with, as Eric Schmidt from Google tells us, with greater connectivity will come greater expectations. And we can extrapolate there by saying with greater patient connectivity comes greater expectations of our physicians. Um, not participating in the public discourse, not being a public physician, or not being an institution with a strong public presence that's engaged is no longer going to be sustainable in the market. It's just a reality. Um, we can fight it. I stumbled upon this by pure serendipity not long ago. Um, but this is a um, um, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who was a famous poet in, in, in the United States, uh, 150 years ago. Uh, gave a speech and wrote an essay called the, uh, the American Scholar. And in it, he described the public intellectual. And the public intellectual, he said, is the individual who's trained specifically in a particular field, but then goes out beyond that and translates it and expresses it for a broader public. It was almost like a gentleman's role. And he saw this as almost a civic responsibility. And when I read this, I, it, it really resonated with me because I feel like I have a responsibility, we all have a responsibility to be public physicians or public health care providers. Okay, we need to fill this role. Go and read this from 150 years ago and you'll see how it really resonates with today's networked uh, world. Uh, Alan Lightman from MIT has had some commentary about this as well. Um, I like that second uh, point down below that inaction is cowardice. And uh, I think it kind of gets to something that I truly believe, which is that we have a, you know, beyond a civic obligation, but a moral obligation to participate. If we look at what happened um, over a decade ago with Andrew Wakefield, uh, Andrew Wakefield here published uh, the paper that made a fraudulent connection between the MMR vaccine and uh, autism. And so following this fraudulent publication, uh, the entire conversation uh, surrounding vaccines and autism was hijacked by a, a shrill minority. And so when these poor young mothers would Google vaccines and autism, they would find this very, very skewed opinion on vaccines and autism. Um, when we consider, um, at least in the United States, the American Academy of Pediatrics, we had 65,000 pediatricians in the AAP during that time. Yet very few were involved in any of this dialogue. Had these 65,000 doctors just once a year, each one of them, produced one blog post, one comment on one of these blogs, a two minute video clip, we would have completely ruled the search engines. So when I speak to large groups of pediatricians in the, in the states, I point the finger and I say, you are responsible and you are complicit in what happened with the vaccine autism debacle. Some of them are offended by it, but I don't care. It's, it's a reality that we, we have an obligation to be part of this conversation. You can, you, can, you can extrapolate this to all kinds of events and issues that we see, that we, we have to be there. And this doesn't end. Uh, in July, um, this 
this uh, Las Vegas television station aired a segment on vaccines and autism, or vaccines rather, and raised the question whether babies even need to get vaccines. And they brought a, uh, a non-physician authority on who suggested that vitamins could be used to prevent some of these early child, deadly childhood diseases. And it was outrageous. And so a bunch of us went to work. I left a comment, a re really well-written comment that um, suggested that, the post, that this, this loop be taken down off the internet and that it was irresponsible. And it didn't get published. And so what did I do? I did my own publication. I used my own platform and uh, wrote a post about how the audience is now the publisher. I don't need a major network to have my voice heard. And so um, I put my, wrote about it, put my comment a little bit further down below. And uh, it gained a lot of traction on Twitter. There's a lot of conversation. And the station heard it. Uh, a lot of the mainstream media picked up on this. And Forbes magazine wrote a story about it. And uh, five days later, the, the, the television station decided to put my post up, and they claimed they didn't have the staff to review my, my, my comment. So um, the, the fight isn't over, and we still have to be there in lots of causes, lots of reasons why we need to be, be public. Of course, I make it sound really easy, don't I? I say we, we put out a tweet, and the Wall Street Journal and Forbes calls, and um, <laughs> you're off to the races, right? Well, there's a lot, a lot of hard work behind this. Building reputation, building relationships takes years and years and years of hard work. Um, and there are a lot of preoccupations for, for docs when, they, when they're going into this space. It's not real easy. Uh, some of these things are cultural, okay? It's what I find so interesting is that physicians consistently are the first to criticize what our patients read, yet they're the last to create the content that they read, which is really horrific. You know, when the internet first came out, you know, Bercy remembers this, they uh, were told uh, not to read the internet, and then when patients were reading the internet, uh, they said, well, the information on there no, is no good. And when we discovered that actually was good information on the internet, the doctors pretty much kept quiet. And so it's been an embarrassing phase of history for us. Um, but Clay Shirky, who's a professor at NYU, may have had it right here. He said that social tools don't create new motivation. So when Twitter first was rising in 2008, there were lots of people who said, oh, this is going to be the great medium. Doctors and patients are going to start talking. This is going to be amazing. But in reality, just because we have shiny new tools doesn't mean doctors are going to start behaving differently, and we've, we've seen that. Um, it's kind of a sad reflection in a way. Maybe, maybe doctors don't know how to use these tools. Maybe it's an issue of literacy. And so I, I, I think it was perfect that Emory brought up um, Howard Rheingold, uh, the book. I'm glad I have it here because you all can see the, the title. It's NetSmart. Um, and he, is a, he teaches at Stanford, and it's a brilliant book. And he, he's one of the early founders in, the, in internet culture. And uh, he suggested, and it makes a great point, that when the printing press first appeared, um, it didn't lead to revolutions right after that, right? People had to learn how to read. The Protestant Reformation didn't happen immediately after the printing press. People had to learn how to read in order for what was coming off the printing press to make any sense. And so, um, he has this quote here, at the interval between technological advance of print and social, social revolutions it triggered was required for literacy to spread. Um, and I think this might have been written about doctors as well, okay? because we're in a period um, of cutting edge change, you know, where, where the, the focus should be moving from technology to the literacies made possible by technology. So we have all these remarkable tools before us, but we effectively have a, a population of doctors that don't know how to read. Um, and so there's been discussion this morning about, about, about uh, digital literacy, and I think I, I can't emphasize enough what, what Bercy is innovating um, and what we're doing at Baylor College of Medicine as well. And I mean, it's starting to happen, um, but we're having this discussion about literacy, and, and there's, there are many, of course, definitions about literacy. We, when we, we think about the psycholinguistic uh, definition of learning to read and write, but when we think, uh, Rheingold says literacy is skill plus social competency, okay, which I think is a great definition. And, when we think about physician literacies, we tend to think of everything in terms of the analog, right? When I was a medical student, we had to learn how to go to the library and pull books off the stacks, how to use a Xerox machine, how to dictate into a dictaphone, okay? Things have changed, and we now have a, a complete new set of literacies. There are many, many that we could come up with, um, but, um, you know, just to name a couple, you know, network awareness is one. We have to recognize and start to work and function within, you know, within networked environments. We're no longer in this alone with respect to our education and with respect to patient care. We're part of a broader global network. 
Uh, input management. We talked about this again. The first panel this morning talked about this, and Anne-Marie talked about information overload. Um, and uh, as Clay Shirky again likes to say, that this isn't, uh, we're, we're not facing so much an issue of information overload as we are an issue of filter failure, right? And so we have to train our physicians to understand that they are responsible for creating their own filters. Okay, no one's going to do it for them. And I do that, of course, every, with, with Twitter. This is just a great illustration of how I take the noise, all the, the noise that's happening in the world, and I hire 800 people, mo many of whom are in the room today, um, to bring me things. And it's always remarkable when I, um, I'll, I'll see some, get something off of Twitter from the New England Journal of Medicine, show it to my peers, and they'll say, Brian, you're so smart. How do you do all this reading? You must get up at 3 in the morning. And I say, no, people bring me things. And I just know who, uh, as Anne-Marie said this morning, I know who to listen to. And I'm very, very careful about who I listen to. And, um, um, and, and it creates this human signal. So we're using these human algorithms and human, uh, human people-powered algorithms um, to drive our our human signal, and this is going to become increasingly important as time goes by. Um, this, is, this graphic is from David Armano, who's got some uh, great graphics like this. And then finally, there's the issue of creation and translation. Um, I, always, I always fantasize, I, I think about Baylor College of Medicine or, or, or what some of our institutions, the, the mental strength we have within those institutions. What if we could take what these doctors know within these institutions, the stories, the clinical vignettes, the mistakes, the hard-learned lessons, if we could take those, translate them to digital format, okay, package them, put them out in a place where they're tagged and, and retrievable, what a remarkable resource that would be for both patients and for medical students of the next generation. Okay, and so I think um, teaching doctors how to translate what they know into digital format, making simple videos, how to write for a digital audience, how to write in micro style, how to write in short, constrained media, are new skills and literacies for this age, if we're going to be effective. Um, and I just want to finish by suggesting that one of the things that really uh, holds us up is what I like to refer to as a culture of permission in medicine. Um, I had two medical students with me not long ago uh, at Texas Children's Hospital on our pediatrics rotation. Normally, I'm a pediatric gastroenterologist, and during our teaching time, we, you know, I talk about vomiting and diarrhea and worms and other things like that. And, um, this time we got talking in our session about kind of the future of, of medicine. And uh, specifically, we started talking about how we're going to prepare the next generation of doctors for what lies ahead. And these two young women had the most remarkable ideas. The ideas started flying and they had this, this little framework for what it might look like. And I said, this is fantastic. Let's, let's put this into a blog post. And I was thinking, we put it on Kevin MD's site, and I'm thinking about 800 words, lots of white space, some subheading. And I'm going through my mind, and as I said that, their, their faces kind of sank. And they said to me, who do, I need to, who do we need to talk to? We need to talk to the dean before we do that. And at that moment, I realized it was all lost because the, the brilliance of these two young women was sort of being inhibited by this culture that we live in, this culture of lockstep walking where we only talk when we're given permission to go to the mic. Um, you know, we believe that we have to go through some sort of filtered media in order to communicate. This is a huge roadblock. Um, and so instead of permission, we really need to, 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 to promote this culture of participation where doctors are, are creating. Uh, you know, participation is the key. It's the underlying element in a public physician's uh, toolkit. And so we're completely ineffective without that element of participation. And so um, I think it's something that we need to uh, need to uh, teach and encourage and you know, change our cultures within our institutions. And I think in the interest of lunchtime, I'm going to try to cut it off here. And we're going to, I think, have a panel or questions. Thank you.